Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today and with my special guest. My name is Janice Malillo, the host of Stories That Inspire Us. And I just want to say, have I have a question for everyone. I know that at some point or another, we've all probably experienced some trauma in our lives, anxiety, depression, perhaps addiction. We go through life transitions. Mm -hmm. And I think when we go through these things, it really does something to our self-esteem. And when I met with my guest, and I'll introduce her in just a moment, we really hit it off and she really has a genuine heart for caring for others. So I want to welcome to the Stories podcast, my amazing guest, Kimberly Parker, Welcome to Stories. Thank you so much, Janice. I'm so glad to be here with you today. And I just really, really appreciate um, you providing this wonderful platform. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, you are the Chief Executive Officer, CEO of Revive to Thrive Wellness Center. Tell us a little bit about Revive to Thrive, because that is such a catchy name. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Revive to Thrive Wellness Center is a solo practice. We offer, um, well, I say we, but I offer um, counseling services to individuals who are struggling with things like trauma, life transitions, anxiety, depression. Um, and a lot of my clients, um, they're at a place where they love their families and they love their loved ones, um, but oftentimes find themselves um, with a little bit of friction because they are working on being their best and highest self, um, but their family members are not always doing the same thing. And so we try to find this like happy medium between um, being your best and highest self and coexisting in a system that can be very unhealthy at times. Um, so that that's the client that I see often. Um, we were a group practice revived to Thrive Wellness Center um, for about the first or uh, year two and most of year uh, three, however, I decided to go back to solo um, last year in an effort to follow my heart and really do the things um, that make my heart beat the most um, so that I can really open my time up. But the name um, comes from a place of wanting to do exactly how it sounds, wanting to help people who feel like they're stuck revive themselves so that they can get to a place of thriving opposed to just being in a survival state that a lot of folks find themselves in. You know, and obviously, Kimberly, you are the expert at this. And I feel, you know, when you are in probably that position where you're trying to just survive, and mm -hmm. as you mentioned, um, the friction aspect of it, and that just is a whole different dynamic for a person that is suffering from that they they know that they want to for the lack of better words get better yes and it's like how they navigate through that so that's what you obviously assist them with absolutely yes that is that is definitely what i assist them with and i'm just having a moment of reflection yesterday when i got off work and just thinking goodness gracious my clients are so brave they're so brave they work so hard and I'm just incredibly grateful that I get to do this work. It's very, it's a very interesting job that you, you go and, you know, I know something I heard this week that will never get old to me is like, um, I've never told anyone this and like just a lot, having people, um, being in spaces with folks where they're getting things off their chest that have been making them feel so much pressure and so much weight like there's really nothing more rewarding than that for me. Right. And I think when you're able to divulge that to someone, and I think I shared with you on our pre-podcast chit chat that stories came about the, my podcast um, from my son's life-threatening injury. And by the way, I just want to, everybody knows he's doing very well and I'm so blessed and grateful but I think for me as a parent going through that experience, Kimberly, I really, I, and I get choked up when I think about it. I really didn't realize 
how deeply it affected me as a parent. Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think I think it's it's moments like that, right? Where I think I, I come across that from time to time is like you're so in the thick of what you're going through that you don't realize until maybe weeks later or months later, like, oh my gosh, that was really traumatic. Like what I went through, like, you know, because you find yourself in go, go, go mode. I mean, especially I can imagine in being the mom, you're just trying to fix and make sure everything's okay. And so it can be very hard sometimes just to like slow down and remember, oh my goodness, this happened to me, this happened to my family. Um, and I need to talk about that. I need to process that. So I think this is such a cool therapeutic tool, uh, Janice, like knowing that you took something that was like really, really scary and really, really just painful and you turned it into a really beautiful thing, which is this podcast. Well, thank you so much. And, and obviously it was, you know, truly inspired by something, um, my son said to me, in one of my many trips to and from Philly. And I was in the process of leaving, making sure he was all set up. You know, he had just gotten out of the hospital again. Mm. And what he said to me was, and I'm obviously paraphrasing this, but he said, mm. mom, you know, he, he gave me a big hug and, and he, you know, was holding my shoulders, mom, you know, you, you got to continue to um, take care of yourself and, and do the things that you love to do. And of course I bawled my eyes out, but I think that it was his way Mm -hmm. as he felt, I'm assuming, and we've talked, I've talked to him about this. Like he was feeling my energy as a parent. And I'm like, I realized in my drive going home that that was a very, not only a profound moment for him, but for me as well. And this is like my way of giving back, I guess is what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love too that, that honesty and that vulnerability that your son shared with you. And then as a parent, how you took that information in and how you digested it. And then to see how it's manifested is, is pretty, it's a pretty cool. I can imagine full circle moment. It was, it it really was. And, you know, I, as I shared, (laughs) excuse me, just a few minutes ago, he's doing very well. I am blessed and grateful and I am glad I am where I am now. And I look back at the whole entire experience, not just for me or my son, but for my family and friends that were affected as well, who really took it on their shoulders to take care of me yes, and make sure that I was okay. And, and I am so blessed and grateful. I, I love that. I love, and I think too, that piece that you speak to there reminds me of community. I mean, community is everything. Um, we need each other. I, I know a lot of times we hear um, it takes a village to raise a child, but I think it takes a village to raise an adult as well. And uh, really be able to make it through this thing that we call life. That, that is so true because I, I don't, you know, if I didn't have the support system, for instance, for, you know, obviously what I went through, I, you know, I, I'm kind of just shaking, thinking about it, like, you know, and I'm so blessed and grateful that I had the support and the love and that I have, because, you know, it was kind of a crazy time, obviously. Um, You know, and when I think of those unique challenges in our life and, um, especially when it comes to, and and I want to talk about a very sensitive subject that I think may be very sensitive to to people is addiction. (laughs) Because, you know, we hear so much about addiction lately and and mental health. What are some, I don't even know if I'm even asking this the right way, but what are some like things like it, maybe a family member is experiencing somebody in their family that is going through addiction and, you know, mentioning community and having that involvement. What are some tips or something that you could say to somebody right now going through that experience? Absolutely. I mean, I would say my, my heart absolutely goes out to them because um, 
it's not an easy thing having a family member that is sick. And I use that that uh, term sick opposed to um, addicted. Not, not that that would be wrong, but um, I look at addiction from a medical model opposed to a moral model, which is like this person is doing something bad. I mean, it truly is a disease. And so, um, you know, what I would say to that person are some tips or one, um, know that it is hard to support someone in that type of situation. And because of that, it is very important, even though it's a lot easier said than done, mm -hmm. to create distance to protect yourself. And that can look so many different ways. So like that might not look like never seeing the person again, especially depending on, you know, you might even live with the person or you might have to see them every week or, you know, every couple of days. But if you can create some type of distance, because oftentimes because that person is using the people who are around them the most are caught in the crossfire and they're the ones who oftentimes get the most hurt. And so anytime you can create a little bit of distance, maybe that means instead of going to the family dinner for three hours, you go for one hour, or instead of going to the week vac family vacation or family reunion, you go for a couple of days. So creating distance in any way that you can. And then I also think it's super important to find yourself um, around like-minded people. So anytime, I know when I was doing my internship years ago, I would lead a family group and the group was specifically for family members who had loved ones who were struggling with addiction. And I think the the power in group is that, you know, you're not alone. You're no, you know that you're not the only person who's going through it. And I think there's a lot of power in that. It almost reminds me of like, um, you know, back in the day when in school and let's say I didn't study for the quiz and my friend didn't study for the quiz either. Like that's terrible and that doesn't feel great. But like knowing that we both didn't study, it felt just a little less bad, you know, because <laughs> um, we were in it together. And so I think that's how the group experience works too. It's like, this is not the greatest situation of why we're here, but at least we're doing it together. So I say having your own support, um, being able to create distance. And then I also think about, yes, if you can get yourself um, in therapy or working with the coach, I also think that that's very important because again, oftentimes when you have this sick family member, it impacts you in many a different ways. It might impact um, your, your uh, family formulation and how you show up. I know a lot of folks who grew up in households with um, an, a member of the family who was sick um, they find themselves sometimes either being the clown because they want to break the ice or they find themselves being the hero. So they're a perfectionist. They try to do everything right and everything good because it's all about not upsetting that family member who is sick, who is causing a ruckus around the house. And so I think doing your own work to determine how the addiction has impacted your life and how you show up. I think that is another thing that I would recommend. So community, your individual work, as well as distancing yourself um, when you can um, in a way that works for you. Mm. And what you just said about, you know, how, if you can like ask yourself, how has the addiction affected your life? Yes. That's pretty profound because that includes so many different facets. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're you're so right about it. You're so you're so incredibly right about it. And I think about um, you know, in my personal experience of having a loved one who struggles with addiction. And um I I found myself um it 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 can impact your thoughts. You know, um, I know a thought that I used to have um as a child was like oh, this person, um, they care about, you know, their addiction more than me. And so it starts making you have this, what we might call a core belief of like not being good enough because you figure, oh, if this person likes this more and they don't like me, then I must not be good enough. And so that has been a lot of my own work that I've done over the years with my therapist. It's like, that is absolutely not it. It's just 
the way that addiction works in the body and the biology of it, it absolutely takes such huge control. And there are things that are going on there chemically that um, in some cases when individuals stop, I mean, it, for example, with alcohol, it can be uh, deadly for someone to stop cold turkey. And that's how much it truly in, impacts the body. And so um, I think it can impact your thoughts. I think it can impact how you show up in the world. Um, I think it can impact, again, if you find yourself in that system, sometimes you find yourself walking on eggshells, you don't want to displease the person. And so sometimes that manifests in being a people pleaser because wow. you don't want to upset people and you just want to keep everything cool, calm, and collected. And so um, it absolutely can impact your thoughts, how you show up in the world uh, behaviorally. Um, and also how you manage your emotions, because again, when being in that system with someone, they can be quite emotional, either on the end of extreme anger or very happy, depending on, you know, the substance that they're using, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you don't know, is this a happy day or is this a sad day or is this an angry day? Um, oftentimes that can impact your emotions and your mood um, as you continue throughout the lifespan. Mm. And you mentioned core beliefs before, and I think sometimes core beliefs mm -hmm. are, can be our misguided perceptions of what somebody's perception is of what we're going through. Yes, absolutely. I think with, with a core belief, I, I look at a core belief is like, I think about the word core a lot when I think of that word and really what it is are these things in life that have happened to us. And then we now have this belief, this really, really strong belief because of this thing that happened to us. And so um, it might be, um, I know a common one is like um, when an individual has been abandoned from their parent, um, they now have this belief that they're unlovable because they say, well, if my parent left me, I must be unlovable. You know, and so now when they're going throughout the world and they're making friends and getting into <clears throat> romantic relationships, you know, they're in a place of like, well, this friend doesn't like me or this, you know, partner doesn't like me or love me because, I mean, surely my my parent didn't if they left me. And so I, I look, um, there's a movie, uh, I always forget the name of it. It's by Pixar, if I remember correctly, Inside Out is what it's called. And I think they do a really nice visualization of how core beliefs are formed because in that movie, the little girl, I mean, she's a little girl and she's having these like real lived experiences and um, things are happening. And so they form these like core memories and core beliefs um, that impact her world. And I know they're coming out, I think, with like somewhat of a sequel that's going to get a little bit deeper into the emotions and, and the thoughts, which is really cool. Mm. I'm not sure if I saw that picture, but I'm now curious. I have to certainly check that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you say um, lived experiences, obviously a lot of times we don't expect certain experiences to happen. Therefore, you know, it's pretty much... Mm -hmm. And again, you're the professional on this. It's pretty much a trauma mm -hmm. that someone experiences. And I am wondering when, for someone perhaps that may be listening to this broadcast at a later point in time, yeah. what can you say about something so unexpected that may happen? And let's... Um, and I just maybe want to reference what happened to me as a parent, but maybe it's something obviously totally different for yeah. somebody else. What is something that they really can do for themselves in that moment? Because quite frankly, when I got that call, I had no clue what I was doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think in cases like that, Janice, when the, the event is happening is, to remain compassionate with yourself, because I think we never know how we're going to show up to certain situations that we've never been through. 
And so I, I find myself like as a, as a therapist, but also just as a person uh, being very compassionate and also encouraging a lot of compassion, because what I find in moments of uh, crises, you don't always show up as your best self. I think you can have all the tools in the world. And that's what I find with some of my clients. We may have gone over all of the tools possible. Well, not all of them, but a good majority of the tools, maybe their favorites that they use in their day-to-day -day life. But when crises happens, you know, we have these responses to trauma. We either fight or we flight or we freeze. And so I think it, it can be very hard to pause in moments like that and say, okay, let me do this. Let me do this, what I've learned. And so because of that, um, I very much so live by like a 70, 30, 80, 20 rule that like 70% of the time we're going to get it right. And about 30% of the time we're going to get it wrong and that's okay. And so in those moments, I would say to be compassionate with yourself. And if you can, no pressure, but if you can allow yourself to pause because there's power in the pause. If you pause, then you can start utilizing, okay, do I need to do some deep breathing here? Do I need to make this phone call? You can really take a moment, take a beat, just to figure out what your next best move is. That is so true, because I go back to that evening when, well, actually it wasn't a phone call, it was a text message. And I'm in that respectable age bracket where I get up in the middle of the night and yeah. I received a message saying, you know, what had happened to my son. And I just totally freaked out. And, you know, I, I always want to recognize those who were there mm -hmm. to help me, obviously my husband. And of course, the next call I made was um, to my sister, Carol Sue. And then I have to start, you know, notifying my family um, because they weren't sure my son was going to make it at that point. And I am so grateful that I had that support mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that love yes. uh, because I was determined at that point at 2.30 in the morning, I was driving myself to Philly and everyone's like, no, mm -hmm. like they saw the, they saw what they knew what I wanted to do, obviously get to my side, but they're like, okay, let's, let's take this one step at a time. We know we got to get you there. Let's figure out how we can get you there safely. Safely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So like, it's almost like they encouraged a pause for you because you were going, yes. cool. mm -hmm. you were going, and, and understandably so Janice, I think understandably so so the, the love and support from your community helped you to slow down and make a decision that was going to keep you safe and get you to your son so that you could support him. And I think that's huge. So I think, yeah, that would probably be another huge part of it. It's like, if you can't regulate things on your own, finding a safe person to be able to co-regulate with in those very traumatic moments. Yes, I had to mute myself for a moment. <laughs> Excuse me, I have this mm -hmm. clock thing going on. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I, you are so right. And, you know, I just want to say that what you said, power in the pause, like, is just, it's so incredibly powerful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's so, there's so much that can happen there. And I, you know, I, I teach my clients skills that I, I use myself because I'm also human and life also happens to me. And so I think, yes, really finding those moments where you can just be quiet and be still and allow yourself to see what comes from that state of being opposed to a more elevated or escalated state of being that will not always encourage the next best move. Right, because obviously when we're calm, we can make rational decisions, but when we're in the height of that emotional state, mm -hmm. that can lead to perhaps not a favorable outcome or a decision to do yes. something correctly. Absolutely, absolutely. You are 120% spot on. Yeah, that I think, 
yeah, anytime you're making a decision in a place where you are feeling elevated or escalated, um, or even the other way, you know, if you're feeling more low and down, um, I think that, yeah, trouble can absolutely come from that. And oftentimes it does. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Kimberly, I know that you are, you're based in Texas, if I'm correct, correct? Yes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Now, do you um, work with people around the United States or how, like if somebody wanted to contact you, how would somebody get in yeah, contact? Absolutely. So yes, for, for therapy work, I am only licensed at this time to work in the state of Texas. So my clients are from all over, you know, I've got some folks in Houston and Austin, just kind of all over. Um, however, I also offer coaching services as well. Um, and so coaching is in a, is a bit different. And I break this down on my um, website. You know, coaching is more so for individuals who are like, hey, these are my goals. These are what, what I want to work through. I would say it's a supplement to therapy or for individuals who have already gone through therapy and done a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, so we might work on things like communication and um, how to engage with your your loved ones or your partners in a way that might be more healthy. Um, might even talk about managing emotions. Um, and so I would say like therapy takes you down here. I think coaching is up here and then it helps you to to elevate in, in that way. That's almost my visualization of it. Um, but folks can get in touch with me on my uh, website. Uh, my email address is actually at the very, very top of my website. So um, my website is www.revive, the number two, thrive wc.com um so that's one way they can get in touch with me or i'm on uh instagram as well and my handle there is kimberly parker underscore lpc um and then we also have our facebook page um as well revive the number two wc um facebook page as well i try to do tiktok for a while but goodness gracious i just can't keep up with all the different <laughs> apps there's so many and I'm not the most tech savvy Janice so you know I just have to kind of go with the the ones that I can use uh, uh the best right now which I, I'm on LinkedIn as well so LinkedIn under my name um but that's where I'm at right now LinkedIn Facebook Instagram and through my website uh I can be reached wonderful. there wonderful you. you know, this has been such an amazing conversation, and I really want to pose another question to everybody. Where is the power in your pause? Mm -hmm. Think about that for a moment. Revive to thrive. Yes. So many great things that we chatted about today. Kimberly, of course, I will make sure all of your contact information is in the mm -hmm. show notes. I hope you definitely will consider coming back soon. I would love to have this ch chat further. Absolutely. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. And remember, your story matters. And perhaps your story, your story, may empower others to create that power of pause moment and to reflect and move forward. My name is Janice Mullalo, the host of Stories That Inspire Us today, truly inspired by my amazing guest, Kimberly Parker. Thank you all so much, and we shall see you again very soon. Bye for now.